Awesome. All right, very good, guys. We are going to get started. So um, let me quickly introduce uh, Chef uh, Matthew to everybody. Um, a little bit about Chef. Um, he's got a lot of experience. Um, he's been a chef to cuisine. He's been a sous chef um, and also an executive chef all over the country. Uh, lots of experience. And he's also got a couple of fun, fun hobbies that he uh, shared with us. Um, one of them is forging. Now, Chef, what, what do you forge for? I, I, I'm curious about that. I forage for uh, a lot of different things uh, here in the Pennsylvania area. Yeah, I'm just outside of Valley Forge, so there's a really great wealth of uh, like trails and forests here. Uh, I get mushrooms year round, pretty much. Uh, I just found some wild enokis not too long ago, uh, about two wow. weeks ago, I'd say. Get some nice oyster mushrooms, so I don't really have to go to the store for much as far as vegetable wise. Uh, there's a lot of really nice greens that grow around here. Um, and then of course some like wild salad greens as well. Um, so it's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there and if you just know what you're looking for and know, like, I mean, you can find it everywhere, even in the middle of the city. It's really cool. You can just walk down the street and be like, oh, look, there's some chickweed and nice. you're just, like blown away by like what grows where. So, um, it's really fun. I mean, I don't eat everything that I find, but I'm always out there like just picking around and seeing, seeing what's there. Um, so yeah, super cool. Super cool. And also your gardener yourself. What's, uh, what grew for you the best over this last, uh, this last summer? So this last summer, I didn't have a big garden this year. Um, the biggest things that grew for me were some edible flowers. I use them as garnishes. Um, I really love squash. So I tried growing some of those. Uh, I found some wild asparagus and tried to transplant that. I got a little bit of that popping up over here. Um, so that, that's pretty much what I, uh, I, I grew around the area. I don't have a lot of sun, so I can't grow tomatoes. Um, lettuces grow really well, but I kind of stayed away from those just because they take a lot of work. Um, but there's, there's a lot of things that I try to get in my little garden. Very cool. Very cool. And chef, thank you so much for introducing yourself. I'm going to let you go ahead and, uh, take over as far as our, uh, demo for the evening. Uh, let everybody know what you're going to be cooking up and chef, the crowd is all yours. Awesome. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. And, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight I am going to be demonstrating one of the dishes that I did oh, way back when, back in like I don't know, about 10 years ago now, uh, I was working as a sous chef, chef de cuisine at a fine dining restaurant. And this was one of our holiday dinners that we did. Um, it was a little bit different. We did a few things different. We didn't do the roasted potatoes. We did confit potatoes, um, but they take a little while longer uh, in order to get down. So I tried to switch it up and you know play around with it just about uh, every time I redo it. So tonight we're gonna be doing a roasted rack of lamb. Uh, I'll be searing it off to begin with, give it a little bit of flavor by butter basting it, and then I'll get it inside that oven and finish roasting it off for you. Uh, while I do that, I'm going to get those veg uh, roasted off, get them ready to go so we get this really nice, beautiful sear on there. And then we'll demonstrate the making of the sauce as well as the plating process. Um, it's really simple, but really elegant when you get to it and flavor combinations come out really beautiful. And of course, you can always play around with it. If you wanted to add like herbs or like Parmesan cheese goes really well with the roasted potatoes. With the uh, the Brussels sprouts, you could always add like a balsamic glaze to them, give them a little bit of acidity, it goes really well with it as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can play around with um, and really change those flavors that, that go really nice with the lamb. So I'm going to go ahead and get started for you. We're going to get this lamb ready to go. And I basically... If you guys read the recipe over, which I hope you did, you guys noticed that I marinated my lamb. So I like to marinate my lamb just to give it a little bit extra flavor. And of course, when we were doing this in the uh, the restaurant that I was working at, we were uh, sous vide our lamb. So we would actually par cook it in order to get these flavors uh, a little bit more infused into the product. But I like to just marinate it just uh, while I'm at home just to get that, that flavor infusion in there a little bit more. And I like to use an olive oil marinade while I'm doing this, uh, just because uh, all the other marinades tend to add moisture, sugar to the product. Um, and when you have that moisture and sugar in there, it tends to caramelize up a little bit more and you run the risk of browning. So with the olive oil marinades, it, you're just adding a little bit more oil to it. It helps to denature the protein but it also helps to infuse 
that flavor in there, especially if you infuse the flavor in to begin with. And that way uh, we can get that rosemary and that thyme inside the protein as opposed to just on the surface. So as my pan is heating up, I'm going to season my lamb. Make sure that I get a good coating on there because this is what's going to help to create that crust. It kind of dries out the surface. And when we dry out that surface, it allows for that oil to sear it up much quicker. So we're looking to get that really nice, beautiful crust on there because that's going to give us the flavor for our sauce as well as the, uh, the protein. All right, so we want to make sure that that pan is nice and hot before we put our oil in there. That way it doesn't take too long for it to heat up. And we're trying to get this just about to that smoke point. Now, each oil is going to have a different smoke point. This one I'm using here is going to be an olive oil blend. It's about an 80-20 uh, blend of olive oil and canola oil. So it's got that really nice flavor to it. Uh, but it has a higher smoke point because of that blend with that canola oil in there. If you were to just use a regular olive oil, that smoke point is going to drop down a little bit more because it's going to have more saturated fats as well as particles in there. So we always like to make sure that we can get that nice high heat sear because we want that color. We want that flavor. All right. Now, once I get my lamb into that pan, I am going to need to be able to baste this with some herbs and some butter. All right. So make sure that oil is covering the bottom. Oh, and you hear that nice steer as soon as it hits that pan. That's what we're looking for. That's how you know that that lamb is getting that nice, beautiful, caramelization on there. If you didn't hear any searing going on, what's going to happen is your, your lamb can stick a little bit more. And when it sticks, you end up ripping that caramelization off the, the surface of that lamb. And we don't want that. We want that surface to stay on there. We want that lamb to have that nice, beautiful color. So if we start taking it off, taking it away, we're leaving that flavor in the pan. Now, it's not gone, it's not gone forever. We can always get that into the sauce, but we wanna make sure our protein is nice and presentable, nice and beautiful. So we wanna make sure that that high heat hits that lamb right away. All right, now as this lamb is searing, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna prepare my garlic because we wanna make sure that we're able to pull out all of those flavors within that garlic. Now we don't need to chop this up super fine because of the amount of time, or the, I should say, because the butter is gonna pull out a lot of that flavor. So just smashing it will release the oils within inside that garlic. This way we can draw out those flavors and be able to get them coated on that lamb. So you can see how I'm getting this nice, beautiful golden brown. I'm gonna let it go for just a little bit longer just so I can get a little bit more color in there. And that way, that roasted flavor just draws out and intensifies a little bit more. And while this is happening, it's already starting to cook my lamb. I like to temper my lamb to begin with. I don't ever start with a cold product. If that lamb is cold, when you put it in the pan, it likes to seize up right away. And it starts to cook a little bit too much. And if it starts to cook on the outside a little bit too far and the inside doesn't allow for that inside to warm up as fast, it's gonna take longer in the oven and you're gonna get an uneven cook. That tempered lamb allows for the whole lamb to cook a little bit more evenly and a little bit more all around. So now that my lamb has a nice sear all the way around and the reason why I like to sear it is so that I can sear in the juices, okay? If we were to just throw this lamb in the oven and just high heat roast it the entire time, what's gonna happen is this lamb is going to sweat out 
a lot of its juice right at the very beginning. It's not going to allow for those juices to stay inside and it can cause your lamb to dry out. Even if it gets to a nice medium rare, it's still gonna sweat out a lot of those juices. It's kind of like the same way as making jerky. You're just making a high heat jerky. Um, so it doesn't give you as great of a product unless you sear it. So I almost pulled that out of the pan. So now that I have my lamb seared off, I'm gonna get my butter, my herbs, and my garlic in there. About two to three tablespoons of butter is good. You don't need too much. Chef, what kind of herbs are those? That's gonna be thyme and rosemary. They're gonna be the same herbs that I put inside of my, um, inside my marinade. That way I can infuse just that much more of that flavor into the dish. And we like to tilt it a little bit, just so we can get that butter into our spoon. And you gotta be very careful at this point that your pan heat is not too high because if it's on too high, this butter is gonna brown and then eventually gonna burn. Now the browning of that butter is actually a good thing. It gives you a little bit of a nutty flavor, helps with that caramelization process a little bit more. But if you go too far, then it's going to start to get smoky and bitter. And then we don't really want that flavor in there. So we always like to cut it a little, keep it a little bit on the lower side. And that way we can get some good flavor in there, but not too much. So All Chef, right. one of the uh, the viewers here um, asked, is mid heat level range, like, is that a good point or pretty low like what what range are we talking about temperature wise right now i'm working on about a medium high because i did sear my protein and left it on the same heat that i was on but if you notice that my butter didn't brown up right away like it didn't go immediately brown that's a good sign you don't want it to like immediately start to burn uh brown and burn the second you put it in that pan so if you see that it's starting to do that turn the heat off Turn it down a little bit. Um, let it sit for a second because you don't want those those colors to overdevelop early on in the process. All right. So now that I got my lamb basted, I'm going to go ahead, turn this off because I'm not going to need this for a second. We're going to get this ready to go into the oven. And I like to take my herbs and just kind of put them on top. That way, they can get a little bit more flavor in there. A couple of questions from uh, the viewers, Chef. Sure. Um, is any pan okay? Uh, any pan is not usually okay. So I normally, when I'm making a pan sauce, because that's what I'm going to be doing after this, when I'm making a pan sauce, I like to use something that is a little bit easier to control. Stainless steel works great. Aluminum tends to get a little bit hot and then cool off relatively quickly. Cast iron holds its heat really well, so you end up burning your butter a lot of times. So there's very different pans and they all work great for different things. Um, but you always wanna make sure that you're familiar with what you're working with. Um, so I've had a lot of experience with all clads or stainless steel pans in general, um, as well as cast irons to know that I can do this with both of them. And you have to, like, if I were doing this with cast iron, it would definitely take a lot more attention uh, if I were doing that. So you want to be very careful. Got now, it. No, another question real quick. Um, can the same cooking method be done with a small boneless lamb? It can be done with a small boneless lamb. Absolutely. Um, the rack of lamb, uh, I just choose it because of its presentation. I think it looks absolutely beautiful. Um, the difference with the boneless lamb is it's going to take less time to cook, okay? Because you have that bone in there, that bone is going to heat up differently. So it's going to take a little bit longer to cook. Um, so you just gotta pay attention to that as well. Now I went ahead and I stuck my thermometer in there. If you join the school, you'll get one of these as well. They work great. I set my temperature for a 129 because I know that that carryover cooking is gonna take this right to a nice, beautiful medium rare once this is done. 
And I'm just going to throw that into the middle rack of my oven. And we're going to let that go. All right. Now, while that's in the oven, I am going to be making my vegetables. All right. We'll get this out of the way. We're going to start with our Brussels sprouts. Now, Brussels sprouts are one of my favorite seasonal vegetables that we have this time of year. A couple other ones are going to be broccoli, cauliflower. Um, I love Brussels sprouts because you don't really get them much throughout the year. Uh, nobody really likes them except for around the holidays for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, probably because they're fresh, but they have a lot of nutrients in them. They have a lot of things that you can do with them. Um, I like to give them a nice little bit of a char because they get this almost like burnt popcorn flavor to it, uh, but it's not like that overpowering burnt popcorn flavor. Um, so when I do them, I like to just take them and split them in half. How are we going to do that? We want to make sure that we are removing the core because that core likes to be a little bit dirty sometimes. It, it turns gray when it sits out for a longer period of time. And we just don't want that presentation for our product. Um, one fun thing about, or sorry, one uh, great thing about these Brussels sprouts is that you can do these in advance. You can cut these the day before. And they'll hold overnight um, and dry out a little bit more, which will help them uh, develop a little bit more of that caramelization that we wanna see. I like to pull apart the uh, the outer leaves that are just kind of free. Um, that way they don't fall off while I'm roasting and get in the way. They're still good, we can still use them, but if we leave them in the pan, they can inhibit the browning that we want with our uh, the caramelization process. So I just like to take them, remove them, and that way we got these really nice, beautiful pieces. Cut them in half. The reason why I like to cut them in half is because now we have a nice flat surface that has a nice yellow center that we can caramelize and it gives us kind of that color contrast uh, that we're looking for. Chef, um, question from um, the viewers. So um, Tiara, she asked um, the, the lamb, uh, did it go into the oven uncovered or covered going into the oven? Uncovered. So I never cover anything when I put it into the oven. Uh, and the reason for that, if you come to school, you're going to learn a lot about it in our roasting week. But the reason for it is roasting is a dry heat cooking method. All right. We want to make sure that we keep that protein nice and dry so that it is able to develop that golden brown crust on it. If we cover it, all it's going to do is just keep steam in because that lamb is going to cook out some of its juices. It's going to start to sweat. And when it sweats, we get that steam. So we wanna make sure that we keep that steam out and away from that lamb. So we, that's why we never like to cover anything when we're roasting. Great question, great question. And Kiva is asking, can you cook frozen and fresh the same way? No, so frozen is gonna be already started to break down just because of that freezing process. The freezing process will uh, take the moisture that's inside of the vegetables and it will break the cellular bonds down a little bit. As it freezes, it expands and those cellular bonds will pop. So there's a lot of vegetables that don't freeze really well because they don't hold up really well during that process. Um, so no, it free frozen vegetables and fresh vegetables do not cook up the same. All right, so with my uh, Brussels sprouts, after I split them in half, I just season them with a little bit of olive oil, salt, and pepper, and we're just gonna give them a toss. Just, whoop, lost one. Just to kind of get everything coated with that olive oil and those seasonings. And the best part about these Brussels sprouts and these potatoes is because they're both relatively low moisture vegetables. I mean, potatoes do have a good high uh, moisture content to them, but because they're relatively low in moisture and they take about the same time to cook, you can cook them on the same pan. Now, if you're doing larger batches, I do recommend you split them up, um, but you are able to cook them at the same time on the same roasting pan. And what I like to do is I like to make sure that they are all facing down. And the reason for this 
is because that flat surface is what I want to caramelize. I want to be able to see that roasted look to them and be able to showcase that when I put this on the plate. So we're gonna put these face side down and that way they're gonna be getting like a, a, a surface contact and the oil underneath there is essentially gonna sear them like they're in a saute pan. So we're gonna do the same thing for the potatoes. Again, I like to cut them in half. Now, I found these really beautiful German butterball potatoes uh, at my local store, which I was hoping to get, um, but they didn't have at the very beginning when I wrote this recipe. So I did the recipe for those tricolored potatoes. If you ever see them, the baby ones, they work great as well. And they give you a nice offset color. They'll give you some purple, some red, some whites in there, um, as well as some varying sizes. But again, we just wanna make sure that they are washed, split them in half so that we have that nice flat surface again to work with. And then we are going to season them up and get them in. Chef, uh, Raymond has a question. Um, should everything be room temperature before cooking? Everything works better when it's room temperature. The only thing is, is if you're not going to use it right away, or if you're not gonna use it today or tomorrow, the longer you leave it out at room temperature, the more risk of bacterial growth you have. So the more risk of getting somebody sick there is. Um, so generally you can't leave something out at room temperature more than four hours um, per the health department. So if you're not gonna use them right away within like an hour or two, um, I don't recommend leaving them out at room temperature, but if you bring them up to room temperature for maybe 20 to 30 minutes before cooking, everything cooks so much easier, so much quicker, because if you think about it, if you put something cold inside the oven, say 30 degrees, it now has to come from 30 degrees to like 400 degrees when you put it in a 400 degree oven. Or if you're at room temperature, it's already at 90 degrees, depending on the temperature of your house um, or where you're from so on and so forth, it has less time. There's less space for it to go up. So yes, generally speaking, I like to take everything out and set it at room temperature. But again, you can't hold it for quite as long. Great question. Okay. And then also Tierra has a question on the baking sheet. Now is a baking sheet with parchment paper recommended for the caramelization goal? I do recommend the parchment paper as opposed to like aluminum foil. Um, me, I just have this Silpat. I love my Silpat and, um, it allows for uh, a nice high heat sear. If you use that aluminum foil, that aluminum foil breaks down with oils. Um, so the longer you leave it on those oils, uh, the more it will impart like aluminum flavor into it. So I always like to use a parchment paper. Don't definitely don't use like wax paper or anything like that. Um, parchment paper definitely works better. Than, uh, than anything else. Cool, and Kiva is asking, uh, what kind of spices did you just use on those potatoes? Same thing, I used the salt and the pepper for the vegetables just to, to, to really enhance their flavor as opposed to adding any other flavor that's gonna cover them up. Now, normally if I wanted to enhance the flavor, I'd probably use like rosemary thyme like I did for the lamb and that way it kind of complements the protein uh, if you use too much of it, though, you can really overpower the dish. We've already got the rosemary and uh, rosemary and thyme in the lamb. We're going to have a little bit of that rosemary and thyme flavor in the sauce just because of the searing process. Um, so if I put too much of that flavor inside the vegetables, it can really overwhelm that uh, that plate. So I like to play along with complementing flavors as opposed to um, flavors that are all the same. So this, uh, once I'm done roasting these, I'll actually have uh, some pomegranate seeds as well as uh, some, some kumquats to garnish with for a little bit of color. So it'll give me a little bit of acidity and will give me a little bit of uh, pop in that color and a little bit of contrast. So now that we have our, our lamb and our vegetables in the oven, those are gonna take about 15 minutes. Um, the lamb itself, depending on how you like it cooked, we're looking to cook it to a nice, medium rare, right around 135 uh, for that temperature. And then of course, for the vegetables, we're looking to get a nice, beautiful golden brown, uh, beautiful golden brown roast on them. 
So I do have some that I pre-cooked already. Oh, look, TV, oh, I did it. They're all done. Um, so we're gonna show you that after this. But right now, I'm gonna go ahead and make my sauce. All right, so you guys remember I had my butter in there. Well, I don't want all this fat inside of my sauce because if I have all this fat inside my sauce, my sauce is gonna end up being very, 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 very greasy. It's gonna look almost like a vinaigrette by the time it's done because it's gonna separate. So what I wanna do is I wanna bring this just back up to temperature so it kind of loosens up a little bit and then I'm gonna drain it off, get it out of that pan because I don't wanna get all of that extra fat inside there. And then once I have that done, we are gonna start on that sauce making process. Get the knife out of the way. Chef Matthew, um, let's see here. Uh, Raymond is asking how he came about this recipe. So this recipe is something, it was kind of a mishmash of, oh, I would say like six other recipes that we did at the, uh, the restaurant I worked at in California. And the rack of lamb was kind of a staple on the menu. It was something that sold really well. Um, the roasted vegetables were... Uh, everybody loves roasted vegetables during the winter because it's so easy to do. Uh, they just have that kind of hearty flavor to them. Um, and it's almost like a warm, like a warming flavor in the cold months. So those, those roasted vegetables are, uh, just something that kind of played off of the roasted lamb. And then you go kind of go together with everything. You got, already got that oven on. Um, so a lot of people would do the same process with everything. It's kind of like the one pot meal method uh, that came about all the way back in, I don't know, I want to say like the 1800s um, when they started bringing around like the, uh, the, the casseroles and stuff like that, where you would sear your protein, where you would roast your vegetables and then you would get everything into a sauce and you would braise it down. Um, it's kind of that similar method. You're keeping all of the flavors in the dish all of all the same so that they complement each other and play off of each other. So I'm just trying to remove a little bit more of that, that butter out of the pan just because I didn't get it all. I'm going to take a small paper towel and just wipe the edge uh, just to remove the rest of it. All right. Now that I have this out, my pan is starting to warm back up. I'm going to take my pomegranate juice. Pomegranate juice is something that has a little bit of a sweetness, a little acidity to it. And sometimes if they're overripe, they can be kind of tannic. Now, if you're not sure what tannic is, um, think red wine. Red wine is very tannic. It can get a little on the bitter side. So you wanna make sure that you're playing around with it. Uh, if you don't have enough acidity in there, you wanna add a few drops of vinegar to it. Red wine vinegar um, can help to really balance out that sauce and cut through it. Um, the pomegranate juice that I'm using was uh, fresh squeezed. Uh, I did use uh, whole pomegranates in order to get this. Um, so it's got a little bit more of that acidity compared to like the uh, the palm juices that come in the bottles. Those are gonna be a little bit more of that sweetness that, that I'm talking about. So the one thing I wanna do is I wanna reduce this down. The reduce, reduction of this is going to concentrate those flavors because we only have about two dishes worth of lamb, I really only need about two orders of sauce. So if I have a lot of liquid in here, that sauce is just gonna be really watery, really thin. We don't want that. We want that sauce to be able to stick to the protein so that we can kind of coat it with it. Uh, when, we, when we cut into it and dip it in there, we want that sauce to stick to it. Uh, there's two things that sauces really do for a plate um, and that's flavor and moisture. Because if you overcook a chicken, gravy is going to make it nice and moist. Um, so you always want to make sure that your sauces have those two things in there. Um, of course, you could always do this very differently. If you don't like pomegranate juice, you could always substitute the pomegranate juice for red wine. You could substitute it for, um, I used to do it with orange juice and kumquats. Uh, that's why I really like the kumquats. They're also a seasonal uh, fruit this time of year. So you can really play around with it. Uh, when you get into it. And um, this is one of those things where you just develop flavors, you develop skills. If you take those techniques, you can change the flavors all like for every dish and just kind of uh, play around with it. Chef, a couple of questions. 
So Tierra is asking, how do you properly go about separating the butter butter from the oil? What tools are used? So I don't I separate the, the butter from the oil. So I just take the butter out of the pan. Um, that's all I'm doing after I uh, after I baste the uh, the lamb with it. Uh, I want to make sure that I get that out of the pan so that I can make the sauce and that butter is not in there to cause my sauce to break. Because at the end, when I finish my sauce after everything's reduced, I'm also going to mount that but with some fresh butter to give it a nice shine and kind of cut through some of that acidity that's going to be in there. Oops, sorry, I just kicked the egg leg of my table. Um, but the uh, we don't ever we don't ever really need to separate it because after you've cooked with butter, all those milk solids have separated out. They've already kind of browned up and uh, become like little dry particles. It's going to look like oil anyways. Cool, great question. And um, another question is, could mirin be used as a vinegar, vinegar substitute to give more oriental flavor? Absolutely, mirin could. Uh, mirin is going to be one of those things that's going to be a little bit more sweet um, and not quite as acidic. You can find some that are a little bit more on the acid side. Um, but generally, I would combine that with probably a little bit of rice wine vinegar to give it more of that oriental um, just, to, just to play around with it. Also, can you use bottled juice? Of course you can use bottled juice. Bottled juice is something that works great. Uh, it helps save time. I'm gonna tell you, probably I've spent like two hours peeling and juicing pomegranates to make this just because I, I enjoy that fresh flavor as opposed to the palm juice, which is a little bit more sweeter, like I said. So palm juice for the pomegranate juice. All right, very cool. Um, and let's see here, just looking at some of the other questions that are in the chat. Um, how long do we reduce the sauce to get it to that desired consistency? That's for Good question. Actually, really great question, uh, because that's going to be different. Uh, every person's oven stove works differently. Um, what we're looking for is a consistency, a thickness for that sauce, as opposed to a length of time. Um, everything is relative here in the, in the restaurant industry. And that's why here at Escoffier, we teach you the techniques, the techniques behind making the dishes. Um, and then you can take those techniques and play around with them because your oven at home is going to cook very, very differently than an oven at a restaurant. Uh, there's going to be more inconsistencies inside your oven at home uh, because of it. Uh, they're just not built the same. Um, so you want to make sure that you are uh, just taking into the into account those factors. Uh, and if we'll go back over, perfect, uh, back over to the pan here, I'll show you what we're looking for. So when we're reducing the pom pomegranate juice down, we're going to reduce this down to what we call au sec. Au sec means dry. Okay, so we're going to take those four ounces. I had four ounces of pomegranate juice in there. And we're going to reduce this down to about one tablespoon tops. Uh, and the only reason why I do that is because of the sugar content within that pomegranate juice. If you take it too far, you can burn those sugars and then it becomes very bitter and smoky. Um, and it can still be liquid when that happens. So you have to be very, very careful of how far you take it. And the things that you're going to look for is you see how I have a ring of bubbling in the middle of my, uh, my sauce. That ring is going to expand. The wider it gets, the less liquid is inside that pot or inside that pan. So you can see that it's getting nice and thick. It's almost got like a um, a syrup thickness to it right now. And that's what we're looking for. We're kind of looking for this to get to that almost jelly-like thickness if it were liquid, because this is what's going to help to thicken our sauce and get it to the proper consistency. So I've got it so it, it doesn't even really barely coat the bottom of the pan anymore. Once you get down to here, you got to be very careful because, again, those sugars can burn. And because it's reduced down to a nice thickness, I'm going to add my stock. And now we're going to do the same thing for the stock. We're going to take this and we're going to reduce this down to about two to three ounces. So I added one cup, which is eight ounces. And we're gonna reduce this by three quarters so that we have about two tablespoons of sauce left. 
And the reason for that is because of that lamb. I only have two pieces of lamb that I really need to make for this plate. Um, so this is, uh, we only need enough for two sauces. Uh, if you have too much sauce, where's it gonna go? It's gonna go in the trash and you're just gonna throw, throw that money away. So we always like to just make enough for what we have. All right, so while this is reducing, check on, make sure everything is going well over here. Get that lamb to the proper doneness. And I got, I'm gonna pull out all of my plating things. Chef Matthew, um, yeah. Ricardo has a question. If it's overcooked, can it be saved? Can it be saved? Um, oh. That depends. Uh, are you willing to eat it? Because if you overcook something for a customer, that customer is probably not going to be happy. Um, that's one of the biggest issues that we have in the restaurant industry. Um, we have to make those customers happy. It's not about how we want it cooked. If we want this medium rare, that's great. But if they ask for it medium well, we have to make it medium well. Um, and that's one of the things that you'll learn here at the school is the temperatures at which you're going to be cooking your proteins at. Um, so we always like to try and cook for that medium, medium rare, just because that's where about 90 to 95% of the restaurants are going to cook it or want it cooked. Um, and then from there, you can play around with it and get those temperatures down. That's why I said for the lamb, I'm looking for about a 130 when I put it into the oven, because that's going to be that rare temperature. And then when we take it out, it's going to carry over to about that 135, which is going to be medium rare. Um, if we take it into that 140, 145 range, then we're getting to medium well. And then, of course, into that 150 is going to be like that well done. Um, so this is going to be probably the one thing that's going to take the longest time. What I like to do with this dish a lot of times is I will cook my Brussels sprouts and my potatoes in advance. I'll have them done because those are really easy to warm up. Uh, you can just pop them back into the oven. They'll be nice and warm, ready to go in, within a few minutes. Um, your lamb, you can cook your lamb, sear it off, put it into the oven. And while your lamb is in the oven, you can start making your sauce. As this is reducing down, uh, this is probably going to take about 10 minutes to reduce. Once this is reduced down to consistency, we'll mount it with butter. By that time, the lamb should be done, uh, should be rested, and we'll be able to take it out and slice it up and plate everything. So while this is reducing down. Chef, a few questions a here. Actually, of a, break. a few questions. Lots of people asking what kind of stock was used. Was it beef stock? Uh, what kind of stock was that? So for the lamb, for this assignment, um, I don't like to use beef stock uh, just because beef stock can be very overwhelming in the flavor profile. That lamb is a very distinct flavor profile to it. And if you start adding that beef in there, it can overpower it very quickly. Um, if you're going to be doing this, I prefer chicken stock or I prefer lamb stock. Now, lamb is not one of those stocks that you find in your store, so you would have to make it yourself. Um, so I went ahead and I used chicken stock for this assignment. And that's right, because that question. chicken stock has a very mellow flavor to it. Then Raymond is asking, after it's, after it's cooked, how long do you let it rest for? I usually let it rest for about 10 minutes because it's a smaller portion. Um, if you're doing a larger protein, like a whole chicken, you'll want to do that for like 20 to 30 minutes. Let that resting. And it's, it's all based off of the size of the protein. Generally, smaller proteins cool down faster, which means the juices redistribute faster. So it will allow for it to kind of um, uh, become that, that even cooking, uh, even doneness a little bit earlier on. All right, All great right. questions, guys. Um, and while we're pausing, um, I'd like to introduce somebody that happens to be in the Oh, actually, no, let's let's hold off on that while you're finishing up, Chef. He pop, yeah, he popped in. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So we will hold off on that real quick. I'm just trying to get, I have some other sauce that I made earlier. And uh, just because this is going to take a really long time. Um, Hey, 
And while we're waiting, someone did ask the question, Chef Matthew, can you grill it and get the same outcome? You can grill it. Absolutely, it will have a similar outcome. So the protein will just have different flavors. Um, it will, as long as you're cooking it to the proper temperature, you can play around with the cooking techniques as much as you want. Grilling is definitely going to be more of that distinct charred flavor to it. Um, you're obviously probably not going to butter baste it, but you could also uh, brush it with some butter during that, that grilling process. Um, and you can, again, play around with some of the, the different things with the, uh, the vegetables. I don't generally like grilled Brussels sprouts just because of that smokiness that it gets. Um, but the, uh, the potatoes go really well grilled. You can definitely uh, get some good flavor out of that. All right. So my sauce that I reduced down earlier. I set it aside, I put it in a different pot. And what we're looking for is a consistency that coats the spoon. You see how it sticks to the back of the spoon and gives me a nice thickness on there. It's if almost syrupy. Sauce, yeah, it's almost got that syrupy like consistency. So if I were to let this cool down, it would absolutely look like maple syrup. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that viscosity. It's what we call nappe. Nappe means that it coats the back of the spoon but it's not too thick and too overwhelming. Once I have my sauce reduced down to the thickness that I'm looking for, we want to mount this with butter. And what are they doing with there it is. Chef Derek is asking, um, what are you using to wipe down surfaces? I am using Lysol wipes right now. And they I'm sorry, not Derek, so Kyle. Much, they are so much easier. I use paper towels to dry my hands. And then I've got the Lysol wipes to uh, to do it. Normally in the restaurant industry, we're going to be using the uh, the sanitizer bucket with bleach. Um, so we just want to do something that's going to be similar to that, where we're disinfecting, getting any possibilities of any bacteria off and making sure that it's nice and clean. So with my sauce, once I have my sauce done, I want to mount this with butter. We're going to do this monte. And the reason why I like to monte with butter is because it will help to offset some of that acidity that I mentioned inside the sauce. The reduction of it is gonna concentrate that and it's almost gonna get like a little bit vinegary. And if we leave that vinegary flavor in there, it can overpower our lamp. It also gives it a nice shine and helps to give it some body that helps hold, like uh, helps to uh, kind of thicken it up a little bit. Now it doesn't thicken it like, like you would think it would create like a roux in there. It's going to thicken it more, um, just give it more of that thicker mouth feel. So we're only going to mount a, like a tablespoon of, or two inside there. And that way it thickens up. If, like I said uh, early on, if we leave the, uh, the butter fat inside that pan, when I go to mount this with butter, it's going to immediately break and turn into oil um, because it's just going to separate that butter away from those milk solids uh, that are that are in there and you're just gonna have butter fat and milk solids. All right, so I'm just gonna set this aside now. So just to kind of recap what I did, I seared that lamb, I let that, I put that lamb into the oven. Uh, I then roasted my vegetables, put those vegetables in. And then when they come out, my potatoes are gonna have a really nice, beautiful kind of roasted look to them, nice golden brown. Uh, the Brussels sprouts are going to have a nice kind of roasted golden brown, a little bit of char to them as well. Uh, and this is where we're de developing those flavors. My lamb. Chef, a couple of questions real quick. Yeah. Uh, Ricardo's asking, in accordance to the flavor wheel, what does it taste like as far as um, the reduction? What uh, to the reduction? So it's going to have a little bit of a sweet, there's almost a sweet raisin to it. So when you cook that down, it cooks out some of those sugars and they almost, if you think about like a fresh grape versus a raisin, as you cook those, uh, as that sits down and goes through that dehydrating process, it transforms that sweetness. Um, and it almost gives it a little bit of a caramelization during that roasting process. So um, it definitely has a little bit of an umami to it because of the butter that's in there. So it's that mouth coating feeling. Um, and then, of course, absolutely, it's going to have some of that acidity uh, that's also going to cut through some of that fat. All right. Perfect. So 
One last question before we jump into the next one. Sylvia is asking um, on the Q&A section, why did you leave the rack whole and not pre-make them into lollipops to reduce cooking time? Uh, because then you can cook them way too quickly. Uh, if you cut them down thin into their lollipops, uh, they do it does reduce that cooking time exponentially. So the smaller they are, the quicker they are going to cook. And if you're trying to sear this up, uh, especially if they're like really thin, about a quarter of an inch slice, uh, those slices are not going to stand up on end. So you're going to be searing just the sides and it's not going to look as presentable. Plus, I want to be able to get that really nice, uh, beautiful medium rare center in the, on the inside. So I'll show you what I, what I, the reason why I like to do that in the whole rack. So if I were going to be doing this, I might cut this down into smaller portions, cut them in like the whole rack was uh, was eight bones. I might cut them down into two as opposed to four and do those a little bit quicker as individual portions. But in this case, it's easier to do the whole rack as opposed to the individual individual bones. All right. So for the plating process now, now that I have everything done, my rack is roasted, my rack is rested. I've got this beautiful caramelization on the outside. It's nice and roasted. It's nice and beautiful, medium rare. And I've got my sauce done. Now we need to think about how we're going to plate this. Now, if you're make, doing a dinner for like 40 people, um, it's all family and you don't care about plate presentation, uh, it's perfectly fine to just do like a family style plate up on this where you just have big uh, bowls of vegetables that you pass around the table. Well, here at Escoffier, we like to think a little bit different. We're going to be putting you in the industry, so we want you to think about that plate presentation and how it comes out and looks to the customer. Because the customers do not eat with their taste buds first. The first thing they do is they smell it. They, it's coming out to the table. They're like, oh, man, what's that smell? And then people will be like, oh, what's that dish? What is, why does that smell so good? And then they see it, they eat with their eyes. Um, so first smell, then eyes. So we always wanna make sure that everything looks nice and beautiful. So with my dishes, I always like to add that little bit of a flair to it. So I will spread my sauce out just so that I have a base to work with. I will then plate my vegetables around. And one of the things that you'll learn throughout your time in the restaurant industry is there's things that we live by. Whoops, that's upside down. You don't want that one anymore. Uh, we live by as chefs. Odd numbers. Odd numbers are more appealing to the eye. So when you have eight potatoes as opposed to seven potatoes, seven potatoes actually looks better on the plate um, because of that. When you have colors, you want to make sure that those colors are showcased. So I have my roasted Brussels sprouts, my roasted potatoes. I'm going to showcase that roasted. If I were to put this upside down, you can see how it doesn't look as pretty as the rest of them. So we want to make sure that that color is facing our customers. And then we want to make sure that we have colors that offset. So I have some nice browns. Now I'm going to have some nice red pop in there. Have some greens. I got some green with the plate. You could always do some fresh herbs on here if you wanted to. I like to stick with like the, the less hearty herbs. So stay away from like rosemary, Time those tend to be a little bit hard to eat. I'm going to give it a little bit of orange because that orange flavor is going to be acidic. Uh, it's also got a nice, beautiful orange. Oranges are also in season this week. So um, I keep mentioning those kumquats. I've done this with pickled kumquats, stewed kumquats. Um, the pickled, obviously, is going to have a little bit more acidity to it, but it's also going to help with that nice brightening of that color. And then, of course, last but not least, we are going to take our lamb. And we are going to slice it down. So I like to start by slicing it into my portions. And of course, 
we've got bones that we have to go follow. So those bones kind of cut down at an angle. I wanna make sure that I'm cutting as close to halfway as possible, cutting through that lamb, and then separate the bone a little bit so I can see where I need to go through. And that's gonna give me that nice, beautiful medium rare on that lamb. And then from here, I will cut down to my individual lollipops and I will plate them on the plate and maybe throw a few more kumquats on top. And of course, there's like a million other ways that you could do this. Like you could uh, glaze that rack of lamb. You could make like a, a pomegranate glaze or a honey glaze uh, and coat the outside of that lamb with some herbs or crust it with some uh, like breading on there. And uh, it will give you another another side of the uh, the nuance of the dish. But when you're looking at it, it's going to go out to the customer and they're going to be like, oh man, look at that. All that time that that chef took to, to plate that up. And you've got all these really nice fall colors that are in there, those winter colors, those winter flavors uh, for that dish. So, and this is one of those things that I have had people rave about uh, for weeks on end. Um, there have been a couple articles written about this roasted rack of lamb before. Um, so it's definitely a crowd pleaser. All right. I mean, that's all I've got for you guys.